Welcome to the EOB podcast, where we talk about the weekend box office and the new openings this week. I'm Benno, and joining me is San Duong. All right, so uh, we have, uh, I guess, was it one or two, two releases uh, last weekend? Yeah, yeah. Uh, with the Secret Life of Pets and Mike and Dave need wedding dates. So we we were, we were both weren't very high on the movie, and um, I guess one of them proved us wrong. We went high on both movies, or yeah, we went high that that high on both movies. Yeah, 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 yeah. Should we start with the Secret Life of Pets? Yeah. Okay. So Secret Life of Pets. Uh, let's start off with our projections on the movie. I think you you had it at a, a forty million opening. Right. And I had it at fifty. But uh, it proved well, I think, both I, wrong. I think you misheard me. I said 104, not 40. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> My ears is uh, experiencing, uh, you know, problems, I guess. Um, right. Yeah. With everyone else too. Everyone else has listened to us is probably experiencing that problem too. I said 104, not 40. Okay. All right. All right. All right. We'll, we'll go with that. We'll go with that. So you 104, me 50. Okay. So, but the movie pulled in 104 million. Yeah, I'm kind of, I'm kind of surprised because I guess people just can't, or families just can't get enough of pets or animals, talking animals. Yeah, no, no, that, that too. But I think the bigger thing is the bigger issue I, I feel is that we're not, we're not the audience for these kind of films. No, no, not not the audience. I think it's just that we mm. are not giving uh, Illumination Universal's um, you know animation arm enough credit. Why, right, why? Right. They yeah, they, they made the uh, Despicable Me films and the Minion films, and and you know those are one of the highest grossing animated. Uh, well, Minions and uh, uh, Despicable Me, uh, those franchise. Well, uh, Minions will be potential spin-off franchise. Um, you know, or or one of the top grossing top commercially performing uh, franchises uh, in the industry. Yeah, you know, like you said, we, we didn't give them enough credit. No, respect, yeah, respect. Really, I think. The great thing with them is, you know, as usual, they're able to make their films for just $75 million, you know, as opposed to Pixar and DreamWorks, who, you know, DreamWorks tend to put in like 140 to $200 million on your films, and uh, Pixar... Pixar's average is around like 200 million per film. So the Illumination is able to produce these massive hits on a relatively low budget. Yeah, um, you, you know, with Pixar and Disney, for example, you know, they go for the state of the mm-hmm. art, right? DreamWorks is trying to match mm-hmm. up with them, mm-hmm. right? And it seems like Illumination is like, okay, you know, we're, we're going to go with good enough and focus all the stuff on the story. You know, our technology, might, while not the best, it's good enough. And I, I guess that proves it with the recent string of successes with the Lorax, the Speaker with Me, Minion, Secret Life of Pets, and I think there was also um, what's the other one? Uh, Horton Hears a Who was the, also them, right? Oh, that's Fox. So just the Lorax, okay? The, yeah, yeah. Then that's the Lorax. But you know, they put together a string of successes. Mm-hmm. It grosses. Um, I, I think this is going to be close to the Minions. Uh, you know, like the Minions had an 115 million opening. Right, it went on to have a domestic uh, total of three hundred and thirty-six million. Worldwide, Minions is a uh, what, what, what you know, like a, a one billion dollar movie. Yeah, this could be a huge, uh, just as well as that. Yeah, yeah, and you know, I see, like I say, I we're not giving Illumination enough respect. We're always guessing low on mm-hmm. their openings, even with the Minions saying, "Oh, you know, can it stand right. alone?" You know, we're always questioning them, and it seems like you know, I think they have enough uh, of a good track record that I think we should give them the benefit of the doubt now. Yeah, you kind of have to now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> in hindsight. <laughs> in hindsight, we kind of have to now. But hey, all it takes is one dud. <laughs> but they've been doing pretty well. Every studio has studs, right? Yeah, but as long as you're, you make more good movies yeah. than bad, and you know, I th- even with them right now, I think, hey, you know, yeah, they're doing the right thing. You know, keep the budget low. You know, they don't have to be expensive. Keep the budget low, and you know, they'll, they'll make money. The, the great thing with them is, you know, even if they have a dud in animation terms, even if, if, if a movie makes a hundred million, they, you know, they, their films only cost 75, so they still, at the end, you know, do international and home video will still make a uh, decent profit. Whereas if they were DreamWorks, who's been cranking out movies for 130 to 200 million and their films make 100 million, is considered a, a, you know, a dud and they lose money. So, you know, Illumination, they kind of prove to the industry that, hey, not every animated feature has to cost 200 million. You can do it for less, less than half of that and still make the top grossing animated films in the industry. That goes to show 
the important thing really is the appeal of the characters, right? The mm-hmm. story, right? And as long as the uh, animation is good enough, it's really good enough. That's uh, Pixar's approach too. But uh, I guess maybe they, you know, they hire more people to work on, on them or they have more voice talents. But their approach has always been, um, you know, when they were doing Finding Nemo, um, even when they were doing Finding Nemo, some of the people in the, especially in the effects industry, you know, after Jurassic Park, and you know, they were like, how, you know, how, how come your characters aren't more photorealistic? And their response has always been like, like Finding Nemo way back when. They're like, well, we don't want to do cutting edge stuff just because, you know, of the technology. We'll use the technology only when we need it. So with like Finding Nemo back then, they needed the uh, water effects because the film takes place in in the ocean and that's when they started developing water effects for that film but they're, they're like we're not just gonna just focus on technology for the sake of technology we'll use it when we need it that's been their whole approach and that's why they're so successful but maybe they're paying the, the animators a lot more than the animators in illumination i don't know yeah it's possible you know like they have pre- uh, you know they need a lot of animation you, you know you see the long list yeah. of credits at the end yeah <laughs> or you know maybe their voice talents uh, cost a lot more or maybe mm-hmm. they just pay people more that could be it too or it could just be the you know the other thing is their technology technology might cost more i don't know but uh, their approach wasn't like let's you know, let's do cutting edge technology. The approach has always been, well, we'll only use it if we need it, if the story calls for it. Right, right, right. But like again, I guess uh, Pixar is its own yeah. level, right? And then, you know, like, like I said, you know, we have to put Illumination really up there with one of the better animation studios yeah, now. Yeah, they have surpassed DreamWorks. Because DreamWorks hasn't been that great since uh, Shrek, since the Shrek franchise. You know, they have Home and they have How to Train the Dragon and the Madagascar films, but those are kind of like in the 200 or, or lower range. And, you know, Shrek was their, their peak, their highlight. They haven't reached those heights in, in a while since. Right, and they're turning uh, out all these uh, other movies. Well, you are, I said before, is there really their, I mean, their art style, you know, and the story-wise, I, it's, they tend to, uh, toward older uh, teens. Um, yeah, yeah, well, I'm not, I'm not sure if it's the... Awesome. It could be, but uh, I, I think early on with Shrek and uh, Shark Tale, uh, you could say that. But later on, their films have been more uh, more stylish and less uh, less uh, photorealistic. Well, the, a more recent example is Home, where I, I like I say they made it make the people more round. <laughs> yeah, and they, they don't have to be round. Like the Madagascar films are like very stylish. Like Shrek and Shark Tale, they. You know, they make the fish and the characters, you know, with human facial features that don't quite look right on a fish, for instance. Uh, eventually, they kind of got out of that. They do have their own look. I think maybe their stories aren't as uh, appealing and maybe overall in general, maybe their characters aren't as cute, I guess. I don't know, <laughs> like you said. But yeah, I, I guess it's just overall, there's always something lacking. Or uh, in those movies, whether you know it's, it's the art style, the story, right. or, or what have you, you know that's the thing with DreamWorks for some reason. Yeah. You know, like sometimes, like even with uh, not that movie called Turbo, right? I mean, you know, it has cute characters, whatever. But for some reason, you know, it didn't perform as well. Yeah, that's the thing. Uh, you know, turtles. I mean, a film about snails who are fast. You know, not something that immediately uh, make kids want to go. Hey, let's go see some turtles. I mean, some uh, snails race. You know. Well, it is really their answer to cars, yeah. I mean, <laughs> you know, and I can see why, right? You know, snails are slow, but they, they found how to be become fast and overcoming all these uh, barriers. It's one of those things where, um, you know, it might be a good story on a lower budget film because it, is, it seems like a story like that doesn't have a mainstream appeal as these other films. But if that story was done on a lower budget, then that would be good. But, the, you know, what I'm surprised by, you know, is the Penguins are mad at Casper. I'm surprised that didn't do as well. Because I feel like that's pretty much the minions for DreamWorks because these penguins were so popular in the Madagascar films. Just like the minions that uh, if they took them out, you think they would attract a huge audience, but it, it didn't. So it could be the story. Yeah, like you said, there's always something lacking about uh, DreamWorks releases since the Shrek films. Okay, I think we focus enough on DreamWorks. <laughs> Well, we're talking about the Secret Life of Pets. Okay, you know the movie is reviewed pretty well. I mean, almost seventy-five percent, right? An A minus in the score. So you know people like it. 
you know, and this is a children movie at when um, you know, it's just the summer when when uh, schools are out, parents have options to take their kids to all these um, you know, different movies like Finding Dory, Jungle Book, and now Secret Life of Pets. Okay, so moving along to number two is the Legend of Zelda. I mean, not the Legend of Zelda, but the Legend of Tarzan. Uh, it came in number two with a uh, take of 21 million. Uh, experienced only a 45% drop off, uh, which surprises me because I thought it would drop off huge in the second weekend, but it didn't. It, and so far, domestic, it grows to 81 million. And, and uh, like you said previously, before we have technical difficulties, uh, the budget is 180 million. Yeah, so I think most people in the industry, it did better than what most people in the industry expected because they had uh, low expectations. They were expecting this to bomb and this, you know, although disappointing compared to the its budget, it, uh, you know, it did better than they, uh, people expected. At its current pace, it'll probably still lose money if it doesn't do better overseas. Um, even though it did better than people expected, you can't call this a, a success. You know, it's still a, a disappointing figure. It, it is, especially domestic. We will have to see what its take is overseas because, you know, overseas can pave over a lot of troubles uh, in the domestic market. <laughs> like Warcraft, for instance, uh, right? right? But, um, you know, but like you said, you know, Legend of Zelda, nobody expected to do... Oh, oh Legend why, of why Tarzan. Why Legend of <laughs> Zelda? Yeah, the Legend of Tarzan, like you said, uh, did better than anyone expected it to do i mean since uh as we said previously that uh, you know there was a better tarzan movie in the jungle book and that one was for kids but this one tends to be older it stars uh, alexander sarsgaard mm-hmm. you know shirtless with the abs and biceps and never underestimate those i guess um and then there's uh, samuel jackson and uh, mogul robbie and i guess for some reason this movie uh seems to capture uh, people's interests but um is it enough uh, to make up for that 180 in 80 million budget. Yeah, here's one of those interesting um, uh, incidents uh, where people expect this to bomb badly, and it didn't bomb, so it, it exceeded people's really low expectations. Now what you're seeing is people are like, oh, this is doing pretty good. But if you look at this budget, it's not. It's just that people were expecting this to be a stinker. But it's not, it doesn't well, no, smell, it doesn't I guess. smell as much, as much as <laughs> people expected. Yeah, it doesn't smell as much, so yeah. It doesn't smell as badly as people expected, but it still smells. That's the thing with this. It's interesting because people are like, oh, this is doing better than expected. But what they expected was complete crap. Right, yeah, it's just what what went on through these people's minds because I heard that the previous Tarzan movies didn't do that well. What made them think that uh, this movie deserved a $180 million budget? I mean, this is like, uh, you know, almost a Avengers level, right? Or, or all these superhero movies level by budget. Like which ones? The latest one I remember is the Disney one. And, yeah, and but previously there's shit. like a Greystoke or something like that. And then uh, like it's like old. And this is kind of like the, the more, more oh, recent okay. uh, non-animation one, uh, but the previous one, you know, in the 80s or 90, you know, or so, or, and, and, and prior, uh, didn't do that well. Ah, okay, okay. Not sure what you say about this other than people expected it to bomb badly. It didn't, but it still didn't make enough to uh, make a profit for the studio, especially uh, on a domestic level. On a domestic level, depending on how it goes for the, the next couple of weeks, well, it's still going to lose money domestically, but it's just how much. Right. Again, it's like they expected this movie to lose a lot of money. It's not going to lose as much money, but it'll still lose money. Right. And, you know, like I say, what what goes through these people's mind that say a Tarzan movie deserve a $180 million budget? It might be the Disney Tarzan movie because they're thinking, well, back then they didn't have the technology to mix something like that in a live action but now they do mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and you know the the disney animated tarzan movie made like uh 180 million or so in, in that range so they're thinking well if that animated film can do that well what if we throw in you know all these talented actors and talented directors and give them a big budget because they can actually do these effects now so maybe that's what they're thinking you know i wonder if this would have done better if the jungle book wasn't released because after you see the jungle book, after you see all those animals brought to life on that film, this just looks like a you know an awesome yeah, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, and here's the thing: Warner Brothers is also making a Jungle Books movie. So yeah, there you go. Oh, hmm. Yeah. <laughs> 
Well, they can just reuse a lot of uh, stuff in this film. I guess so. Maybe that's what they're thinking. Maybe they say, hey, you know, we could probably knock off, reuse, really, uh, you know, the assets uh, from The Legend of Tarzan into the new Jungle Book movie. And, you know, maybe that's where the budget goes. Yeah, huh? Yeah, right. Right. So, hey, something to keep an eye on. Of course, people will, will be completely confused. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know. <laughs> Like, wait a minute, didn't we just see a Disney Jungle Book movie? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we'll, we'll see what their take is. So, you know, one of these movies that could be in perpetual development, but who knows? Right. All right, let's move on to number three. Finding Dory at about 21 million, about the same as uh, The Legend of Tarzan. If by the end of today, when they have, when the final figures roll in, Finding Dory could be number two. They're only about 200,000 off. And... Wait, are these final figures? Yeah, these are oh, final yeah, figures. Oh, yeah, these are this final. Tuesday, yeah. Okay, all right. Okay, never mind. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so Finding Dory uh, dropped by about 50%, which is kind of expected because of direct competition from the secret life of pets. But Finding Dory has already grossed 423 million, and uh, it looks like it's going to be. Is it already the highest grossing animated feature of all time? It's the highest grossing animated feature for Pixar. Did it be Shrek 2? I'm not sure. Let's see. Let's take a look. I think Shrek 2 was the highest before. Shrek 2, it's uh, 441. So in a couple of weeks, it'll be Shrek 2 and become the highest grossing animated feature of all time. Yeah, and right now, in this fourth week, it surpassed Toy Story 3 as the highest grossing Pixar movie, at least domestically. Quite a feat. Uh, worldwide, it's at uh, 647 million. Pretty impressive considering it didn't do relatively that well in China and grossed 38 million, which is on par with other Pixar films in China, but you know, Zootopia did like 230 something million in China. For some reason in China, they don't get Pixar. Even Inside Out only managed like 15 million around that range. So for some reason, Pixar's genius just doesn't translate to, uh, in China. Oh, okay, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, they just don't like their secret sauce. <laughs> well, like I said, uh, China is almost a black box. You know, you never know what's going on there. You know, they might limit the theater's count. You know, a lot of things. Uh, you know, is, is happening. Yeah, there are a lot of things, but for instance, Zootopia, when it first opened, it didn't do nearly that well. But the word of mouth was so strong that they kept on adding theaters. And it eventually rose 200 something mil. But when it first opened, people were, based on its first day's performance, people were just expecting that, you know, that movie would do 30 million tops. But uh, word of mouth was really strong and they kept on adding theaters. And it, it became one of the, probably the leggiest uh, film in China of the year. They're all limited screens, but if they if it connects with the audience, they do add theaters and they do add screens. You know, when you look back at Pixar's library of films uh, in China, even Toy Story 3, I think, only managed. Uh, Toy Story 3 might have done a bit better, but even that didn't do, you know, as well as um, in relative terms compared to how well it did elsewhere in the world. Yeah, okay. All right. I, I'll just leave the China part to people who knew, who knew the area better. So and right. any, anyway, for Pixar, and another sequel is coming out next year, which is Cars Three. Yeah, I... <laughs> we'll we'll see how that goes. We'll see how that goes. Don't discount them yet. Okay, it could be a, another good dinosaur, or it, yeah, it could surpass Finding Dory. <laughs> yeah, Cars Two uh, on domestically didn't do as well as Cars One, and critically, the reviews were horrible. Even the first cost on One Tomatoes was like 80%. Cost 2 was like 35% on One Tomatoes. Worldwide, it made more than cost, but uh, domestically, it did, it did less. And, you know, most people who are fans of Pixar's films try to erase cost 2 from their memory banks. Well, it kind of took a weird turn there with the, you know, spy element thing. Yeah. So... <laughs> I guess they have to continue to crank these cars movies out because they're selling the merchandise. You know, they make billions of dollars a year on just the merchandise. Even though everyone's like, man, that cars franchise sucks. But they have to keep, they have to continue to crank them out. No, because only, of the, the, only toys. the second movie. Yeah, only the second movie. So we'll see what, what happens with, with the third. So if they can recover their footing. Yeah. Even the first call, people weren't that high on it. You know, it, it was more like, you know what, it's John Lasseter. We'll give him a pass for this one. But when Call 2 came out, they're like, hey, we already gave him a pass for Call. We're not going <laughs> to yeah, give him another one for Call 2. Right, right. Hey, you, you know, he's doing good work back at Disney. So 
Yeah, you know, he's doing really good work. Let, let, let's yeah. allow him a, a Cars 2 or another a, a Cars 3. Well, yeah, that's true. He has been doing really good work at uh, Disney Animation. Completely resurrected the studio, so... Maybe we'll give him Cars 3 for that. Yeah, let him handle, you know, put all the negative energy into the Cars franchise and, you know, people just know how to avoid it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll give him another pass for Cars 3 just because <laughs> he's doing such good work, uh, you know, at Disney Animation. Alright, coming in number 4 is the other new release over the weekend. It's Mike and Dave Need Wedding Date. Uh, whoa, uh, you I was way off on that one too. Yeah, you said it would probably pull in or open to about 5 million, and I said somewhere in the 15 to 20 million range. And you yeah, know, you I'm, were right on the mark. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you, you're in tune with the, you know, with the audience on this one. Well, well, at least with this one, I mean, the reviews were relatively terrible, 39% on Rotten Tomatoes. Uh, let's see, the cinema score for this, like, you know, audience is a B, which is okay, decent-ish. Uh, yeah. It's an R-rated comedy featuring, I guess, one of these new trends uh, where, you know, it's really the, the female behaving badly, really. Yeah. Mike and Dave need wedding dates. is kind of like wedding crashers, right? Crashers, yeah. Uh, Except yeah. that it's, uh, it, it stars... Um, it stars Zach uh, Efron. Zach Efron, yeah, but I mean, saying Anna Kendricks and uh, Aubrey oh, Plaza. Right trying to crash uh, wedding parties. Yeah, and it, it exceeded uh, people's expectations. And at, at a budget of just 33 million, you know, uh, it'll make money for Fox. Yeah, I mean, it's one of the few, I, mean, I guess it's an R-rated comedy. Right, it'll be interesting to see how, how well it holds up in the following weeks, but these scores just kind of, I mean, below average though. Uh, it is, but hey, it opened decent, okay. <laughs> yeah, it did open decent, yeah. Uh, it's gone. I think you know. You know, it's not going to be a classic by any means, right? Uh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it depends on how 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 well it holds up in the following weeks. You know, it'll probably pull in thirty something million million total and and make money uh, by a home video. Right, right. Then that's where I think, yeah, it'll probably make most of his money. You know, some actors got together, had some fun, and uh, they made a movie. And I guess other people can share into their fun. Right. All right, let's move on to number five, The Purge Election Year. They had a 12.4 million over the weekend. A huge drop-off on, on this following week, uh, second weekend. But, you know, kind of in line with uh, how horror films usually do on the on the second weekend. Uh, after two weeks of release, it has already grossed 59 million on a budget of just 10 million, so huge profit maker for Universal, and it's doing better than uh, what the first two films did on the second week, so uh, we'll see more purges. Yeah, amazing uh, how well this uh, series is going. You normally you see, yeah. uh, especially for horror movies, right? Except with the paranormal activities, but you know that's kind of like yeah. an exception too. You know, the, the Purge right now is one of these outliers where you know subsequent movies did better than the previous movies. Yeah, 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 and it is holding up well too. Even the Conjuring, uh, the Conjuring two didn't do as well as the first film. Yeah, I guess um, people just like them violence, baseball bats in the <laughs> face. Especially with politicians involved. Yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> I didn't think this premise would last through three films and still going strong. But, yeah. you know, they surprised me. Yeah, but, you know, we both had our, our opening numbers to where it opened to. Uh, yeah. You know, we thought that it would keep up its um, run. Yeah, but I mean, like, after the first film, I was like, do they have more? But apparently they do. They do, and, you know, we saw an uptick in the second movie. It didn't, the second movie didn't yeah. open as well as the first movie, but hey, it made more. Yeah, it held up more when yeah. uh, when it left theaters. Right, right. You know, after seeing the first film, I thought it was just a one movie premise, but it's holding up really well. It's like the Saw series now. It makes like 50 to 60 million. And, you know, how, how many Saw films they did make is like... I, I lost track. I lost track. How many? <laughs> Yeah, it's probably, so probably this up is, to seven or eight, I think. Yeah, so the, the purge is looking more and more like a Saw series. Modestly, low budget, but, you know, it makes 50, 60 million. Or in this case, like around 70 million. And, you know, they just keep on cranking them out. And why not? Yeah, why not? Such huge profits. Okay, so we'll look out for a purge, what, four? Yeah, only four. Uh, I don't know where they'll take this. Uh, this one is the election year. Um, yeah. Who knows where, where we'll go with this. <laughs> Midterm elections. Yeah, I mean they'll take some topical, <laughs> I mean topical element, right? Something that's topical at the moment. Probably the probably Black Lives Matter movement. I guess it's huge right now. Maybe that's where they're heading. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure they're gonna touch that because that's so uh, controversial. You know, with with the election, they can touch on it because it's, you know it's Donald Trump, so you can have a lot of fun with it because it's you no, know, it's crazy, you know. 
<laughs> yeah, well, you know, I get, I, I always feel that like the purge movies is kind of like a, a release valve for people, you know, whatever's irritating them, I guess, and you know, you just need yeah. to watch people take baseball bats and whack, <laughs> whack them. <laughs> <laughs> so who knows? They might, yeah, they might I don't, go yeah. There. Who knows? All right, let's move on to uh, number six, Central Intelligence. It's the film that's holding up the best in the last couple of weeks, so since it was released. The drop-off is only around 30% week after week. Uh, it grossed 8 million over the weekend. Uh, has uh, already grossed 108 million since it, w- it was released four weeks ago uh, at a budget of just 50 million. So, you know, one of Kevin Hart's and uh, Dwayne The Rock Johnson's uh, bigger hits, excluding the, you know, Fast and Furious franchise. Right. The worldwide figure is at uh, 157. Yeah, which is pretty good. I mean, comedies usually doesn't translate well overseas, doesn't travel well. But this is yeah. an action comedy, uh, so we'll see how it goes. And it doesn't seem like it uh, opened in China or will. I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, like I said, right. who knows over there? <laughs> right. Uh, but uh, you know, it's one of the you know one of these um, modest hits uh, because it's budgeted well and it's uh, making money at the box office and it's holding up well. This is better than a modest hit. It goes over uh, 100 million, so I think you can call this a legitimate hit. Like modest hits would be like the shallows, you know. All right. Okay. It's a legitimate hit. But, you know, I have a feeling that it's kind of like the Ride Long series, kind of low key that, you know, yeah, somehow yeah, yeah. it made a lot of money and people don't know why. And <laughs> they, they, they crank out a, a sequel, <laughs> mm-hmm. and yeah. that, which didn't do as well. You know, yeah, I, I get right, a right. feeling with Central Intelligence uh, here as well. Um, yeah, the, the reviews were decent, though. For central intelligence so we'll see how the subsequent films do but who knows maybe they'll uh, surprise us okay i mean they probably try to turn turn it into like the rush hour franchise but you know just like the ride long series can it hold up to two movies it could be just like a you know one hit wonder yeah right all right so moving along to number seven is the uh, certified bomb uh, the bfg um, which is steven spielberg adaptation of a uh, novel um, put in 7.8 million over the weekend. Experienced a about 58% drop off in the second weekend. Um, the budget was 140, and so far only made about at 39 million. The worldwide take right now is uh, 51 million. Ooh, it's not doing well overseas too. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure how how wide it opened overseas yet. Oh, and decent yeah, amount not, of territory. It's not. Yeah, it's, it's not yeah, that not wide, that but yet. it's not promising. It's not promising. You know. Right. I'm I'm curious to see how this will do in the uh, in the UK, you know, because you know it's based off a children's book uh, from the UK. Who knows? Maybe maybe it'll do really well in in uh, England, and I, I wonder if this will get a release in China. Oh, who knows? Who knows? Yeah. Yeah. Well, we, we'll have to see. Uh, Steven Spielberg's name does have a draw overseas, but at its current pace, uh, not good, not promising. Yeah, it's not doing well overseas. It's not doing well here. Uh, the problem is the 140 million budget. Yeah, a bomb for Steven Spielberg. Where we were bomb. We'll see where it goes from here. Right, right. Okay, so speaking of another disappointment, this is number eight, the Independence Day Resurgence, the uh, sequel to a- Independence Day without Will Smith. It pulled in about 7.8 million of the weekend, uh, and it's uh, experienced a 54 percent drop off, and so far only made a 91 million. And the worldwide uh, take is 305. Right. And a budget of 165 million, it, it's not going to lose money. It might even make a profit. But uh, compared to how the first film did, the first film made like 800 million worldwide. This film's not going to get anywhere near there. So we won't see another Independence Day film. Yeah, I mean, this movie, they put pour all the money into the special effects, right? But, mm-hmm. you know, sometimes a star does matter. Yeah. Nobody's paying the money to see Bill Pullman, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, Jeff Globloom. <laughs> yeah, especially I think when when you make a sequel, especially a film that launched Will Smith's career, people probably want to see him back. I'm pretty sure if Will Smith was back, this would would have done a lot better. Like you said, no one's paying to see uh, Bill Pullman. <laughs> and you know, with these special effects, all these movies pretty much look the same these days. You know. Yeah, just blowing up, world mm-hmm. destruction, blah blah blah. You know, you're, 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 you've seen these special effects in other movies, uh, and the thing that's differentiating are the stars, the stories, right? Yeah. Okay, so uh, moving along to number nine is The Shallows, the one that you said is a certified hit. 
or a modest hit. Mm-hmm. Uh, pulled yeah. in 4.8 million over the weekend. Um, the budget's only 17 million. Uh, this this like lively uh, shark attack movie. <laughs> it's made 46 million total uh, after three weeks. Um, so a very profitable film for uh, Sony. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so one of these low key movies that stars a name. It, it feels like one of these uh, Kevin Bacon movies. Um, he's there, you know him, but you know it's not exactly a must see. Right. Except it's doing better than Kevin Bacon movie. <laughs> All right, uh, let's move on to uh, number ten, a Bollywood film that uh, reached the top ten. Sultan grossed two point four million in uh, two hundred and eighty three theaters. Uh, has made three point four million uh, since it was released. I guess in the middle of last week. Again, it's like these Bollywood films. They you know they get released in usually around three hundred theaters, and sometimes they. Uh, they make an appearance uh, in the top ten. Well, this is not just a a uh, in Indian movie. This stars Salman Khan, uh, who is like the biggest star in India, and I I think this movie broke records in India, or probably the top grossing movie in India. Yeah, it made um, thirty eight million according to Box Office Mojo uh, in, in India over the weekend. That's a huge opening. That's a decent size opening in any country. A lot of the other Bollywood films, especially one starring the Khan clan. You know, there's Salman Khan and there's a, a bunch of other cons that are, you know, they're all like huge box office draws. And again, they, you know, they uh, when they're released in the U.S., they tend to be released in around 300 theaters and they usually um, do pretty well, relatively well. Right, right. As we found out from the other movies, they pop in once in a while. And normally uh, when there's like a huge movie like The Secret Life of Pets, that's pulling up all the money. You see the lower grossing ones pop up in the top ten, and this is one of those. This one looks like you'll probably end up making like I don't know six or seven million. You know, as an indie film, that's not bad with a limited release. Okay, so uh, that's it for the top ten. How about we move on to the uh, openings? Okay, sure. Uh, so we have uh, a movie called The Infiltrator, which is open on July thirteen. It stars uh, Brian Cranston, Diane Kruger, uh, John Leguizamo. And then there is the uh, Ghostbusters movie, the Ghostbusters reboot, starring the all the all female cast, um, not all, all female cast, but all female Ghostbusters. Um, I guess which caused quite a stir among the uh, fanboys. Yeah, I don't, uh, I don't quite get that. <laughs> I'm not sure how big the Infiltrator is. This is opening wide. It looks like one of these um, uh, indie movies to me. Right, 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 right. I haven't uh, heard much about it, so uh, you need to take it. Well, to tell you the truth, I haven't either. How about we just skip ahead to our projection of this movie? I'll, I'll go with five million. I'll go with three. <laughs> I don't know anything about this movie. Uh, neither do you. I believe most of the audience don't either. And I, I don't think anyone's that interested in it. Uh, so I think it might be closer to yours, the opening numbers, than mine. Mm, right. Uh, it has about 17 reviews on Rotten Tomatoes. Um, it's at um, 65%. On Rotten Tomatoes, um, okay reviews, you know, okay, not great. For these kind of films, you want, you expect a higher uh, rating. But like you said, kind of a low profile film. You're saying five, I'm saying three. Let's move on to Ghostbusters. Yeah, the movie that most people are interested in. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so it's a, a perfect reboot of the Ghostbusters movie. It stars, you know, Melissa McCarthy, Leslie Jones, Kate McKinnon, Kristen Wiig, Chris Hemsworth. Uh, those are the big players in in this movie, and um, it opened overseas already. Uh, the reviews are okayish. I mean, overseas, uh, people say that it's a okay movie, not great, but okay. And mm-hmm. on Rotten Tomatoes mm-hmm. right now, it's uh, at seventy eight percent. Yeah, uh, well, you're saying it's okay. It's kind of solid. I read some of the reviews, and their sentiment is it's an okay movie, which results in a fresh rating. Right, right, right. Here's the thing: this is a reboot of a real, uh, very popular franchise, and but you know, Paul Feig, uh, in his uh, team-ups with Melissa McCarthy and Kristen Wiig, tend to uh, open in the 25 to 30 million range. This is based on a very popular franchise, so I wonder if that gets a bump. I think it will. If it gets a bump, then shouldn't this be one of those films that will open to uh, in the 40 to 50 million range? Instead of the uh, 25 to 35 million ones. So what what are you thinking? I'm gonna have to say 45. 45. Okay, so you know the thing with fanboys is that they're fanboys. 
I don't know. I, I, I don't want to go there. There's some uh, sexism involved with this movie, right? When, you know, Paul Feig rebooted the movie. That's the thing. I, I wonder if that's been overblown, right? It is. It is. It is. Is it just a few vocal fanboys who are like, eh, I don't want to see, you know. Yeah, they're, they're the, they're, yeah guys, so. exactly. They're the vocal minorities. They're, they don't represent the broader uh, base. Yeah, I wonder if it's just, you know, this, this really small group of vocal people. Uh, and then you know the media makes it out to be that oh all these other fanboys are also with them. My impression is you know like you said it's just a very vocal small group of people that I'm not sure they represent. I'm not sure every if every Ghostbusters fans are disgusted you know or outraged by the casting of this whole group of really you know very, very good uh, comedians, uh, women comedians. When I saw him, I'm like, oh, they got, you know, four really good comedians. You know, I, I didn't think anything was wrong with it. I, I thought it was interesting. There, there's something unique about it. And it's not like they're just throwing any old four group of people. They threw in some of the better women comedians in the film. That's the thing with, with the internet. You're not sure if the outrage is just by a couple, you know, really loud people or does it represent the whole group of uh, Ghostbusters fans? And I don't think it does. No, it, it, no, no, it's just very vocal few that, that take issues with women taking on the roles of, you know, men. Those are r really in the minority. True fans, right? Love to see another Ghostbusters movie. This one has a blessing of Bill Murray, who has been holding this project up for the longest time. Yeah. Well, who knows? True fans are like, hey, why even bother, right? Women or all, all, all men. Yeah, yeah, they don't care. They just want to see a return to, you know, Ghostbusting. Regardless of who's in it, as long as it's... Uh, it's well, funny. I mean, like, you, you know how there's always those uh, fans that are like, hey, don't touch this, leave it alone. Mm -hmm. Like, I didn't have a problem with it. I thought it was like, hey, uh, th this is an interesting twist on it. Right, and if anything, right, they're in good hands. You know, Paul Feig has a good, very good track record with comedies, right? Like yeah. you said, has all the host of pr pretty much the funniest uh, woman comedians. Mm -hmm. In cinema, you know, Leslie Jones, Melissa McCarthy, Kate McKinnon, Christian Wiggs, there. They're in good hands. You know, this this franchise is in good hands. Oh, right. So they have nothing to co complain about. So, okay, so. <laughs> budget I'm is 144 45. million. You oh, 144 million? 144 wow. million. Uh, that's what's listed at. So you say 45 million. I'm going to go. Okay, ahead. you know what? Yeah, yeah. You know what? What? At 145 million, it's going to have to open in the 50 million range. Mm -hmm. I need to revise my uh, prediction. I, okay. I'm gonna say uh, I'm gonna say 55 million. Oh, 55 million. Okay, so yeah. before your interruption, I was going to say 50 million. Okay. Uh, uh, I thought I, I was I said I was gonna get a, a tad higher than yours, but you revised yours to 55. I, I'm still sticking with 50 million. So I'm okay. I'm not sure. Uh, you know, because this movie has uh, awareness, right? And, yeah, it and, does I, have I, and I think the, whatever controversy is there, just uh, fans the flame uh, of this movie really to get uh, more people uh, aware of this movie. Yeah, right, right. I've been seeing a lot of trailers for this film uh, mm -hmm. while watching the NBA finals. The only weird thing is that you know they show NBA players uh, suiting up, which I guess appeals to the you know NBA fans, which is you know mostly males. Right. Uh, but it, it didn't show any of the female Ghostbusters. Which I thought was kind of odd. Were they reacting? Were they reacting to the social media, or are they just doing a more uh, integrated marketing plan with NBA players? Yeah, I I think that's it. Because any time that you can have a more popular star, mm -hmm. I guess, and NBA players are pretty much the star of the NBA, and have them associate with the, your movie, show the bigger star. Yeah. Yeah, actually, that's probably true. When you look back at other uh, film promotions during the NBA, they always have NBA players promoting these movies instead of the actual characters from the film. So maybe they were just doing that instead of the, the a reaction to uh, social media. Right. I mean, you have Kobe Bryant endorsing the movie, his final game, his final year playing. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's always tightly integrated. Like if you have like an action movie, they'll show. Uh, NBA players dunking the ball, except the ball turning into a fireball, you know, that kind of thing. That's right, that's right. Okay, so you 55, me 50, and um, mm -hmm. uh, we'll see how it goes. I mean, I don't think it can go higher, you know, I don't think Ghostbuster is a one of these big movies. But we'll, we, we don't know, right? It could capture the imaginations of, uh, you know, people. We'll see. 
Yeah, we'll, we'll see. Maybe all this uh, uh, social media outrage. Well, we'll actually, you know, brought this from a lot of uh, awareness and, you know, this whole controversy will, I don't know, get women to go out and watch it and guys who are fans of the original franchise will also go out and watch it. All right, okay. I, I have to mention this, okay? Uh, yeah. Something that's disturbing. Um, yeah. I went to my local Target yeah. and, and I saw the Ghostbusters toys discounted. Hmm. So I don't know if that has anything to do with the movie or not. Uh, that's, you know what, that, that's kind of a hard thing to... Um, wow, the first Ghostbusters, the Gamebusters. <laughs> $242 <laughs> in, uh, domestically. Uh, you know, during this time, that's, that's humongous. In 1984, holy moly. Um, I, I'm not surprised because I can see boys playing with the Bill Murray Ghostbuster characters, but... Ghostbusters toys with Melissa McCarthy and you know I can see why they're discounted. Some things don't translate from male to female, like in, in terms of these toys. Okay, so you think that's what it is, because uh, you know males just don't want to play with female figurines. Yeah, and fe and and girls are not. I'm not sure exactly. That's the kind of toys that they usually like to play with. They tend to be not like boys. Let's go pew pew pew. You know, let's go play with guns. All right. So okay. So that's not relevant to. Uh, the movie, I guess, so that uh, Target discounting the, the Ghostbusters toys ahead of its opening. All right. Yeah, right. That's an interesting observation. Though. So normally when these things happen, we, you know, say, oh, you know what? Maybe they're not projecting the movies to do as well, and they're trying to clear it out before uh, people figure mm -hmm. out what's going on. So, but, well, you know, you say, no, that's not it. Yeah, then I guess this is more kind of like the, wait, what, what's that? What's the Pixar movie with the, the rat? Um, Ratatouille. I can totally see why Ratatouille stuffed animals on selling you mm. know as well as other pixar films because who wants a, a stuffed rat as a toy right say what you will that is the last movie featuring a rat yeah and that film despite being well reviewed and despite doing really well i can see why the toys the merchandising didn't sell as well right they rather make a cars 2 and a cars 3 instead of ratatouille yeah. 2. <laughs> That's what I'm thinking is happening with the uh, woman Ghostbuster uh, toys. Okay, all right. So, all right, let's come back next week and see how Ghostbusters did. Um, if mm -hmm. there's anything to this uh, internet outrage uh, that's uh, going on, um, I, I doubt it, but, you know, who knows? Okay, we'll see you next week.